Thank you very much. I'm so glad you all are here. Um, I think dog breeding is the most fabulous thing you can do. I uh, <clears throat> walked onto the uh, grounds of a dog show by absolutely by luck one day uh, in October of 1967. It was Oxridge Kennel Club and uh, showing in Darien, Connecticut, and I was riding a horse at Oxridge Hunt Club and in the morning, and I said, well, what the heck are all these tents on here for? And they said, oh, they're having a dog show. I said, a dog show? They actually show dogs? So I hurried, I rode my horse and hurried home and uh, changed my clothes and came back. I walked down to the grounds of that dog show and into the rest of my life. I knew then when I got there that this is what I've always wanted to do, was raise, train, and show dogs. I just didn't know they did it. <laughs> so as soon as I found out they did it, I, I was there. Um, I think dog breeding is without a doubt the best profession on earth. You hold that puppy in your hand at birth, you raise it, you train it, you love it, you send it off to its forever home, or you keep it and show it and, it, and, and then breed it, and it gives you joy for, for the, the entire length of its life. If we do it right, this is the only profession where we can sell love. I don't know anyone else who can say that. But we have to do it right. Uh, that's the important thing. And, and I believe that early puppy training is a tool to help us do it right. Someone once said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And and to say it a little different way, I think the best way to predict your puppy's future is to train them. I am talking now about early puppy training that starts from birth and up to about 12 weeks old. Um, that's about the time when my puppies go into their new homes, anywhere between 10 and 12 weeks old. So this is the time frame that we're going to be talking about today. Only the breeders can do this training because we're the ones that are there with these dogs, with the, with the litter when they're first born and growing them up. We're the ones. We're the one watching them. We're the ones spending the time with them. And we're, we're the ones that can turn that time into something that is really valuable for them. Now, I do have to start with a little disclaimer. Unfortunately, this uh, presentation, you're only going to see corgi puppies doing these little things, uh, going through their little training. That's not because I think they're the only ones that can do it or that they're the smartest breed that there is. Well, maybe I do think they're the smartest. <laughs> but so I want you, when you're watching this, I want you to put your puppies in there and watch them doing, doing these things as we go through this uh, presentation. Okay, so I believe that whether you're raising puppies for confirmation, for companion events, for performance events, or for just wonderful family pets, any breed, any breed can benefit from a program that I call Head Start for Puppies. Now this is early puppy training, and I mean early puppy training. If I could figure out how to train them before birth, I would do that. <laughs> if anybody does figure that out, would you let me know? Because I would like that. <clears throat> but we start, I start right at birth, and I think breeders can utilize the time that they spend with their puppies to uh, teach them very important skills. Puppy training can be started very early, much earlier than I think a lot of people think. Young puppies learn extremely quickly. And when they're trained as young puppies, they will learn as older dogs even faster as well. It's because we're developing their brain and we're giving them stimulus and their brain is then able to take in much more as they grow. The time you spend with your puppies can really make a big difference in that puppy's future. Okay, the first thing I like to do is bond the puppies to me. When, when as soon as they are born, in fact, in the first five minutes that they're born practically, as soon as we get them breathing and going, I pick them up and I cuddle them to, my, to, to me, get them to smell me. Now they're born, obviously we all know they're born blind and deaf, but they can smell. So that's the first place where you're going to start to bond them to you, is have them smell your smell. The first time my puppies eat comes from me. I, I bottle feed them first even before they start nursing on their mother. So the first food that they get comes from me and, and, the, and the way I smell. So that is what helps form this really incredible bond between me and my puppies. I handle them frequently. I know some people feel they shouldn't handle young puppies. I, I handle them all the time and snuggle them a lot so that they can get a lot of my scent. 
Name that puppy. I, I'm a very big believer in naming puppies immediately. My puppies are named within two to three days after birth. I have a theme for every litter, and uh, when we sit there watching the puppies at first, we, uh, a friend of mine and I, we go through the theme, and then we pick all the names for the puppies. I think it is very important to name the puppies because that way you can start teaching the puppy their name. Now, I understand they can't hear you at first, but if you keep saying, uh, picking up each puppy while you're snuggling it, keep saying its name, it's amazing how fast it can learn, it can learn its name. Right at the moment, I have a singleton puppy. So he didn't hear anybody else's name but his. And he is he, really, at four weeks of old age, he started responding to his name, which I think is pretty, pretty uh, interesting. Not only do I think it's a good idea for you to name the puppies for the puppy's sake, I think it's a good idea for your sake. Because instead of looking at a litter of puppies and saying, all right, well, this is Tootsie's litter, Tootsie's litter is doing this, and Tootsie's litter is doing that. In other words, looking at them as a whole group of puppies. You start talking about them as individual puppies. And that starts you individualizing them. And then they learn that they are not just one big part of a, a litter of puppies. They are an individual dog. And I think that's important. A lot of people, breeders say that they're not going to name their puppies because, oh, why should I name them? The owner's going to change the name later. Yes, yes, the owner can change the name later. That's fine. Uh, I, name, I name them, and then at, at about eight to ten weeks when we decide that the, some puppies are going into the pet home and they have their name, I just change the name for them before the puppy gets to their home. So that is not a difficult thing to do. Then I start shaping behavior. Uh, training very young puppies is all done by rewarding desired behaviors. Obviously, you can't, uh, you know, think of any kind of punishment with a three-week-old puppy. So all we're doing is shaping behavior. One of the first behaviors I like to shape is uh, a response to the word cookie, cookie. That's the word I use. My breed, as, as you probably know, is shown hands off in the breed ring. So they're trained to stand and bait on me. We don't, we don't do a lot of, uh, you know, holding up of the head and tail and, well, we don't have tail, so <laughs> we can't do that. We don't do a lot of uh, hand stacking in the ring. The Pembroke Walsh Corgis are shown pretty much hands off. So I like to teach my puppies right away a word that gets them to focus on me and not pay attention to what's going on around them. And this is good for not only confirmation training, but it's good for any kind of training that you want to do. And this is just an example of some of the things that you can do. Once they start eating on their own and their, their little puppy pan, pan, they're all eating there, I repeat the word cookie cookie while they're eating. So they start to uh, 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 realize that the word cookie cookie is uh, uh, also associated with food and associated with something good. And, and then I teach them later, I start handing them food from my hand so that they start focusing on me. From the time my puppies are born until they are four weeks old, they're in a very quiet situation. They are not, uh, there's no other dogs around them except their mother, uh, so they don't hear the other dogs coming and going from the kennel. They're in a very, very quiet situation. I think it's important, uh, particularly from week three to week four, to keep the dog, the puppy as quiet as you can. That's when their ears are opening, their eyes are opening, there's a lot of stimulus coming to them, and it's good to keep them quiet for uh, at least the first half of that week. So by the time they're about three and a half to four weeks, that's when I start to move them. Then I move them into my kennel. I have a, a puppy room in my kennel and that has uh, a table and a mirror, lots of mirrors, mirrors and the pens all set up for them and everything is set for them. But it is in my kennel, so then now they're going to start to hear all the dogs barking and they're going to uh, hear all that kind of stimulation that I think that is best to they wait till they're four weeks old for that. While they are running around my kennel room, um, I will, what I'll do is at four weeks, start at four weeks, I take each puppy up individually, tell it, keep repeating its name, stand it on a table, and look at it in a mirror to see what the confirmation is. And because I am interested in showing them in confirmation, so I, I have them all teach them to stand first. If I know already that one of the puppies is definitely going to be a pet, either uh, we have things in our breed that at birth we know that they're not going to be able to go in the show ring, either if they're long-coated or mismarked in some way, then I'll teach that puppy to sit starting right away. But basically, I start them teaching stand. I, t I check their bites, open their mouths. Even dogs that are going into pet homes, they have to have their mouths open. The vets always open the dog's mouths. So they have to learn to do that. 
Um, and I also obviously check for testicles, because I'm worried about testicles anyway, so <laughs> we start checking early. Now, as again, if I know that the, the dog is going into a pet home, or if you are out there, you're training, you're raising puppies for obedience, then I would say it's very important to start teaching the dog to sit um, at, at four weeks, because they'll be on a table, you can get them to sit absolutely square. And puppies learn what they repeat. If you start them out sitting absolutely square, that's the only way they're going to know how to do it. And when they get older, that's what they're going to be doing as well. They'll, they'll still be sitting nice and square. I also use the table. I teach them down and down stay. And then I also start at four weeks. All the dogs, whether they're going into pet homes or whether they're staying with me, I teach them how to come when they're called. Coming when they're called is probably the most important thing you can teach a puppy. I start teaching them at four weeks, and that's by imprinting. You know, like the, the mother ducks imprints their, the ducklings on her. I try to imprint these puppies on me. And one of the ways I do it is I take them out into, I have a big fence in yard, and I take them out in the big fence in yard and walk away from them. And they're like, oh, where's mother going? So, so they, uh, they come along with me, and I call them to come. And, and uh, that's the first way I start teaching them. Also, in my puppy room, I'll drop a few little kibbles in one corner, and then I'll go to the other corner, and I'll call them over to me and put little kibbles down in that corner. And pretty soon, they're learning to respond to the word come at about four, four weeks of age. I'm always amused at a dog show when you hear the word loose dog, loose dog, and there's this dog, you know, catapulting through the, through the building or through the uh, rings. I always think, why don't they just call it to come? <laughs> why, why didn't they just teach it to come? That, that would have been so much easier. <laughs> so any dog that um, you're going to do anything with, if it's trained to come when it's called, it's, a, it's certainly a great advantage. Now, then we come to about eight weeks, and, and we start out the sorting process, okay? Which dog is which? Which puppy is which? I'm always hoping that I don't keep the one on the top and I don't sell the one on the bottom. <laughs> this is the problem. <laughs> it's difficult in many breeds uh, sorting out puppies at an age young enough so that you can then get the ones you know you don't want to use in your breeding program into a home while they're still young enough to, uh, you know, a family can enjoy the puppy and, and uh, the puppy can also bond to the family. It, it's difficult. My breed is not a breed where, you know, what you see at eight weeks is what you're going to have as an adult. I don't know if any of you breed breeds like that out there, but certainly my breed is not that way. But there is one thing that you can tell at, um, at about eight weeks of age in our breed is, is the basic genetic temperament the puppy has been born with. And uh, that, I do this through temperament testing. And uh, <clears throat> what we do is we arrange this so that when my puppy is born, when my, my litter is born, I send out a notice to, to all, all my breeder friends and say, we're going to have a puppy test at a certain time so that they're, they all come. We'd like to invite new breeders as well to see this. And I have one person who temperament tests most of my litter. She's pictured there. Her name is Joanne Baker. She's temperament tested almost every litter I've had since 1984. I've temperament tested every litter I've had since 1980. And I used the test that was developed by Wendy Volhard in the 70s. So it's a test that has really uh, stood the test of time and is something that I've been able to really use all, this, all these many years with very little change. The only problem is the test uh, does talk a lot about tails <laughs> and how the tails do this and the tails do that. So we've had to, you know, look beyond that part all these years because obviously we don't have tails to look at. But if you do, uh, you are temperament testing a breed with tails, it, it, it is really, really even more helpful. So at about seven to eight weeks of age, I run the puppies through a series of 10 tests, which are, they're not designed to be a pass-fail test at all. They're just designed to kind of give you an idea of what the puppy's temperament is. They, the test is administered by a stranger to the litter. So Joanne has never seen the puppies before she tests them. They are tested in an area of my home that they have never been in before, and it is the first time that they are ever alone. So they, they, I don't separate the puppies. Uh, I mix them up a little here and there in different pens, but they're never alone until the moment of the temperament test. 
The first test is social attraction, and basically the uh, um, tester gets down on her hands and knees and calls the puppy to her. Uh, I bring the puppy in, put it down in a spot, and the, and the stranger calls the puppy to her. Then the second one is following. She gets up and walks around and see if the puppy follows. Um, the third test is restraint. Uh, this, is a, this is what's happening here. I don't know if I, oh, this, the, on the top slide, that is restraint. She holds the puppy down for uh, uh, about 30 seconds, a count of 30 seconds. And then, I'm going to go back to this, then she lets the puppy up. And uh, what we love to see is a puppy who says, oh, I hated being down like that on my back, but I'm going to forgive you. This is one of the most important tests that I find to see whether these corgi puppies will be able to go into a home with young children. Because young children do things that are very inappropriate to, to puppies. And you want a puppy that's going to say, they do, and there's nothing you can do about it. You want a puppy, if you have a family with young children, you want a puppy that's going to say, it's okay. I didn't like it, but it's okay. I'll, I'll, you know, I love you anyway. So that, that's what we're doing. When I go into the test, uh, I tell Joanne, oftentimes I have people waiting for the puppies, and I'll tell her, okay, I've got a home with young children, I've got a home where the two adults are going to be working. You know, I tell her the different homes that are waiting, and, then, and I tell everybody who's in the room what the homes are that are waiting for these puppies, and then we go through the test and kind of say, oh yeah, well this one would be better for that, or this one would be better for that home. So that's what the important thing is. Okay, then after we do the restraint, we do uh, social dominance, which is, uh, is the bottom picture there. We're holding the puppy up just off the ground and uh, see how he does. Now, unfortunately, my puppies don't really respond to this because they've been picked up so much between the time they were born and the time this test is taken that um, they don't really respond too much to this test. It's not actually one of our better tests. We use it to take the pictures. <laughs> because they look very, very cute. <laughs> that's, oh, I'm sorry, that's called ele ele elevation dominance. That's where, where we hold the puppy off the ground. Supposedly, you want to see how the puppy responds when he's out of control. Okay, now this is the next slide, which you also probably can't read either. Um, retrieving, the bottom uh, slide there is the puppy retrieving a little piece of paper. We throw that out and uh, see if it will retrieve. It's amazing how many puppies will. This is one of the things that we use to um, determine whether this is good obedience a prospect, a good training, pro a dog who really wants to work for his owner and is interested in training. Uh, we do touch sensitivity. We take the pup, hold the puppy and, and uh, put our fingers between the pads and count and see how many counts before the puppy cries. Um, it's very important. If you've got a puppy that you're putting in a home with young children, you don't want a puppy that's sensitive to touch. Uh, and, and some of them are. Pembroke Walsh Corgis were actually bred to be sensitive to touch because they were bred to, and sound, and sight, because they were bred to be herding dogs. So this is something that I, I have to test for and think about. Sound sensitivity, we bang a pot and see how they respond. Chase, we put a towel down and uh, drag the towel across the floor and see what their chase reflex is. This is to decide whether you have a dog that would be a good candidate for herding trials. I personally am trying to breed out the herding instinct of my dogs, <laughs> and I, I, I laugh about that. So, some of my fellow breeders don't think that's too funny, but, <laughs> but here's the thing. Most of my dogs go into homes with children or family dogs, and a dog that has high herding instinct and really a high chase prey drive is not a good a dog, especially for young children. So, so this is something that we test for and we look for. Stability. Stability is the top slide there. We open, this, open an umbrella and set it down. This is something that the puppies have never seen. And when puppies go to dog shows, they're going to see things they've never seen. So I want to see how they respond. Now that little fellow said, oh, yeah, look at that. So this would probably be a good uh, prospect. Uh, another thing that we do is, is that we decide what the energy level is of the puppy. Now, even though you can't read it, you can see this up here. Um, we have a score, and the scores have different, different uh, uh, descriptions to them for the score, and that's how we score it. And then on the actual page, there's a column there where we put comments. So we do write comments because some puppies don't do it fit in exactly to the score, so we want to see, you know, how, how, we, 
put down comments. I keep all these pages and I refer to them later because uh, sometimes an owner will call me up and say, oh, you know, my dog is this or doing this. And, and sometimes I'll go back and say, well, you know what, that, that I, I understand that because the dog showed this kind of a tendency on the temperament test. Here's what I recommend that you do. Then after the test, we bring all the puppies back into the room because now I want to pick my star. That's what I'm there for. I want to pick the dog that I feel is going to be the, the best maybe temperament on the day, and that doesn't mean that I don't change my mind later, but on the day, the best temperament for the show ring and, because that's what I'm doing. And then we stand them on the table, and I have all the breeders there go over them. As I said, a lot of times we have young breeders, so we're teaching them what to feel for uh, on the eight-week-old puppy. And, uh, and, and then we often say, well, you know, this could change, or this might not change, or it's been our experience that, you know, what you, if, if you have this at eight weeks, this is maybe what you're gonna have. But uh, so that it's a learning experience, not only for me and, and watching my litter, but also for the other people there. And one thing I forgot to say is that during the test, I'm not allowed to say anything. Because I have to keep absolutely silent, which if anybody of you know me, is not very easy to do. <laughs> but it's good for me because I have to stay silent and really watch how these puppies are responding to the tester. And then that gives me some ideas. I mean, it has happened over the years that uh, a litter of puppies, I had no idea which one, you know, I had my eye on one. And then another puppy came into that test and just blew me away and turned out to be one of my best show dogs. So that can happen. I love that when it happens. <laughs> One of the things I do with each person there before they can go home, I say to them, which puppy would you take home today and why? And, and that sometimes that helps me because I've seen them every day since they were born, but they're looking at them for the first time. And a lot of times the one I think is the best, somebody else, uh, another breeder there will say, oh no, this one, I like this one better. And it turns out that that breeder is more right than I am in the end. So uh, that's, and again, it's another learning experience for young breeders, which I think is very important. We need to bring breeders along and uh, teach them how to uh, evaluate puppies. So after the temperament test, this is when the real work starts. My puppies are trained every single day from the time they're eight weeks old to the time they go into their new homes. Um, now, I can't always do it all myself. I hire kids in uh, my neighborhood to help me. I have, luckily right now, I have twin girls that live very near me and can walk and love to do this. I mean, you know, get paid for training puppies? I wish somebody had given me that kind of a job when I was this age. So I teach them how to do it and they, they do it for me, which is, is, is a really, is a great thing. The first thing I do is teach them how to walk on a leash. And one of the reasons is because I really can't tell how this dog is going to move uh, going to be how good a show dog the puppy is going to be until I see how the dog handles himself on the lead. Some of them you put a leash on and the dog goes, you know, like that. Some of them you put a leash on and they go like this, you know, and, and that's, that's it. I mean, you can, we hope we can train them to walk better, but not always. So leash training is extremely important. I know breeders that don't leash train their puppies till they're four or five months old, but I like to start at eight weeks and, and get that going so that I can see how that's gonna work. One of my little tips for leash training is uh, the best thing that works for me, there's lots of different ways to do it, but one of the best ways that works for me is to have the pen of puppies outside, uh, um, all of them in one pen, take one of them out, walk about 10 or 12 feet away, put the leash on and walk the puppy back towards the pen because the puppy's anxious to get back to his litter mates. And they, they really don't really realize that the leash is on. And then every time you go further and further away and, and walk them down. That's, that's the way I like to introduce the leash. And then later, you know, we do more with the leash and more individual training as well. We teach them stand for exam, of course, because uh, my puppies are, are, are my, my breed is judged on a table if they are not uh, if they are not uh, able to stand on a table while a second person examines them, uh, you know, you might as well forget it. So I start them right away. Uh, I, I say I start them really at four weeks standing on a table. We teach them to free bait. That comes a little bit later. I like to teach them to stand, stay on a table without food first and then introduce food later. And uh, free baiting, of course, is when they learn to stand on their own on the ground and look up at me. 
crate training. Every puppy after the temperament test, each puppy is put into its own crate. So that it's very well crate trained before it goes into its new home. That's so important for not only socialization, but of course for housebreaking and other things. My new owners always come to get the puppy with their crate and they are trained on how to uh, crate, continue the crate training of the puppy. But it's a lot easier for them if that puppy's already crate trained before it goes to them. Obedience training. Now, if you if, is again, if the puppy is definitely going to be either a pet or I have somebody who's interested in obedience, uh, then we, we really concentrate on sit and down stay. Again, come, still the most important thing you can teach the puppy. Um, Fetch, I also teach them to fetch. I actually teach all my dogs to fetch. The, the dogs that are going into a pet home, uh, if they learn to fetch, it's the best way to exercise them. The biggest health problem in Pembroke Walsh Corgis is obesity, and that is totally owner controlled. So if I can give them a way to exercise their corgi without having to exercise themselves, which seems to be the way most Americans want to do it, um, then it will help in the health of that puppy later because uh, hopefully they can keep the puppy uh, a little thinner. Again, uh, with come now, I, now that they're leash broken, I start teaching come on a leash. I teach my kids to back up and call the puppies to come while they're on leash, always with lots of treats. I, do, I am lucky that I have a breed that's very food motivated, and I do use, obviously in the training of young puppies, use lots of treats. I use small treats, I use cat food at first. They love cat food, and it's, uh, it's smelly, and it's small, and it's easy for them to chew. Now, no matter what it is you want to do with your puppies, if you start introducing it now at, at eight weeks, uh, it, they will be much better at it. No matter what it is you want to do, you want to do field trials or dock diving or barn hunts or, or tracking or herding or anything that you want to do with your puppies later. Think about it now and start introducing them to it. Obviously, this little fellow is never going to have any problems if he goes through an agility tunnel. Tunnels are no problem for him because he's been sleeping in them since he was about, uh, you know, six weeks old. But it's sort of fun to think up things that you could do that you that you could do with your puppies and introduce them to as a young age. Uh, the agility people they start them on teeter totters, and all of the kind of a they have small baby puppy sized agility equipment. So uh, whatever it is that you want them to do, we can start doing it now. Grooming. Grooming is so important. I, I know I see people who say, oh, you know, I, this, my dog is so frightened of the blow dryer because I, you know, I never introduced them to it. Well, I, I think you should introduce any kind of grooming things that your breed needs right away. Because even if it goes, it goes excuse me, even if it goes into a pet home, grooming is so important for the life of the dog. And if a dog is happy to be groomed, the new owner will groom it more. Uh, if the dog is horrified by having its nails done or, uh, you know, uh, being combed or being blown dry, the new owner is not going to do it. And, uh, and, and it won't be, it won't, because it won't be fun for them. I, I start weekly nail trimming at birth. My dogs that stay with me, their nails are done every week from birth to death. That's why most of them put up their little paw and say, can I go in the pet home? Because I bet you the pet, I bet you the pet home's not going to do my nails every week. <laughs> so I begin bathing them at six weeks or sooner if they need it. And uh, I introduce blow dryers first on, on the adult dogs. I just have the puppies around while the blow dryers are going. And then, because my breed is blown dry at the dog shows, so... Um, at first, they just hear it, and then, then as they get older, they go on the table and start to be bone dry as well. Well, okay, so this is a lot of work, obviously. It's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of time spent and a lot of work and money. I pay these kids to help me train the dogs. So what, what is the benefits of this? Well, first of all, puppies learn what they repeat. And this is what I tell my new owners. Puppies learn what they repeat, and you promote what you permit. My, my, my little puppy owners, they go out repeating that <laughs> when they leave my house. But this is true. Puppies learn what they repeat. And if you just have them repeat just exactly the way you want them to do it when they're an adult, that's all they're going to learn. They're not going to learn the wrong way to do it. So, um, so that's so important, especially for new owners that maybe have never had a dog before. Um, they, they're getting a puppy that's already trained, already know how to do things, and they, they feel so much more confident taking that puppy home. Um, 
Also, puppies will be ready to compete early in all the AKC events if, you're, if that's the kind of thing you're doing. Now, luckily, now AKC has decided to have four to six uh, month puppy classes at their shows, and I love that. I love all. I love doing all the little puppy things because my puppies usually are. They might not be the best one there, but they're usually the best behaved. <laughs> so, so often I win early, quick because they're the only one that'll walk on a leash, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, now uh, we have these four to six month puppy classes, so that we can take puppies to shows early. I'm so pleased about that because I think again, if you want them to go be a, a show dog and a, as an adult you need to uh, introduce them to that early. Or introduce them to mats and all kinds of things that have to do with the shows. So the benefits of early puppy training. They learn what they repeat. Through early puppy training, they don't learn any bad habits. They, they can be placed in the right home for them. This, this puppy here uh, was sold into a family, uh, 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 a woman who was very fond of her elderly mother-in-law. And she said, I want a puppy that not only is going to be good for my family, but can go to the nursing home and, and be good for my mother-in-law because I'm so fond of her. Unfortunately, this woman has now passed away. But when that puppy was just, they only had it for a few weeks, and off he went to the nursing home, and look at the smile on, her, on the mother-in-law's face. That, that's, what, that's why I do what I do. Um, they'll make an easy transition into their new homes. First of all, you're going to place them in the home that's right for them because you've decided what temperament is right for that home and you've trained the puppy to go into that home well. And then they make that easy transition into the home. It's good for them, good for the new owners. And everybody is really happy. Also, the new owners are going to feel very comfortable contacting you in the future for, uh, for any problem they might have with the puppy down the road. I always say to people, when you buy a puppy from a breeder, and especially when you buy from this breeder, you not only get the puppy, you get me, whether you like that or not. But I think that's something that's very important. And I think if you train the puppies first and then show the new owners when they come to take the puppy home what training you have done with the puppy and even get them to practice a little bit. They feel comfortable then calling you if there's a problem because they know you trained that puppy. You put the puppy together, so if they take it home and it starts breaking, <laughs> they figure they can call you to help put it back, and that's what you want. You want them to call you because you're the one that knows your puppies the best. You're the one that knows what they do and what they don't do. Uh, not only in behavior, but also from the veterinarian. I have saved my puppy owners, really, thousands of dollars to the vets when they call me up and say, the vet has decided that the puppy has X, Y, and Z. And I'll say, well, you know, I, I don't think so. I, my puppies don't usually get that. They might get something else. But so this, And this is the kind of rapport that you want to establish with your owners. Also, the, the most important thing that a dog breeder can have is an active pet market for the pet puppies. You cannot keep breeding and keep, and keep trying to improve your line and keep trying to get that great one to go in the show, show ring with or the obedience ring or the agility ring, whatever it is you're breeding for. You can't keep doing that if you can't sell the pets. So you've, you must, the best asset you can have is an active market for your pets, Pe a big waiting list for those pet puppies. I have a waiting list that's about 12 months old, and I just, I, I just cut it off half the time because I have so many people that are waiting for my puppies. But that's great because when I decide, <laughs> like Sherry said, when you said, okay, this one's out of here, I, all I have to do is pick up the phone, and I've got somebody right there. I, I look at the puppy. I think of the temperament of the dog. I go to my list, see what they're looking for, call them up, and the puppy goes off into his pet home instead of staying with me to be a show dog, which I've decided that he's not going to be. So, so that is, is one of the reasons to do all of this. I think it is so important. So this is a picture of Clarabelle. Clarabelle was um, 10 and a half when that picture was taken. She won an award of merit at our national specialty at 10 and a half years of age. And uh, she had a, a fabulous career, winning many uh, specialty best of breeds. Uh, she won her grand championship after she became, uh, after she was spayed as a veteran which means that you ha she had to win either best of breed, best opposite, or select bitch at specialty shows that would allow her to be shown as a spade bitch. So that was pretty difficult. She had a fabulous career, and, and uh, we're 
she won uh, order merit at last year's specialty at 10 and a half. This year's specialty in September, she won the veteran sweepstakes at 11 and a half. And we have retired her now. But she would like to leave you with a thought. If she could talk, this is what she would say. Everything she needed to know for this fabulous career that she had, she learned when she was a puppy. <laughs> Thank you.